The following interview was conducted with Professor Joseph Haber, Professor Emeritus of Political Science for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, July 16, 2009 in Stewart Center. This is part two of the interview. Uh, the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Haber. We'll start with the Jewish Studies Program, which you were somewhat been involved with. So take it from there. Well, I was involved in a major way How because... How it got started. Uh, because... Uh, uh, let's put it this way. I, I got involved in Jewish studies in a sense, in a major way, as a rebound from political science because I had been, as I said last time, heading, heading not directly, but heading a program in science, technology, and public policy. The then uh, chair of the political, not chair, the head of the political science department was in general not very keen on interdisciplinary programs and the, he was, I th thought, that he and the department were very narrowly disciplinary and, and didn't like the whole idea of science, technology, and public policy. And while I was in Israel on a sabbatical, that program was, you know, without even ta talking to me about it, was unilaterally disbanded. I mean, I, I wasn't called, I mean, I could understand why it might happen. You know, there are some of the reasons that program goes down, but there wasn't the, what you might call the courtesy of saying, calling me up or writing me and saying, hey, uh, we're going to have to do this or I'm going to have to do this and let's talk about it and so on and so forth. Uh, it was, I came back and all of a sudden there was no program. And I had also had written a news, uh, a, a big newsletter all over uh, science, technology and public policy newsletter. And uh, that was, so, so I was not obviously not very happy warrior. I was really miffed. I mean, I thought, not that the program had closed so much, I'm mean, although that, you know, you could... Where was the courtesy thing in there, to let you know? Yeah, I mean, the plans I come back, and then he had said also that the department had voted on it, and I found out that wasn't true. He had unilaterally, and I thought that was, uh, um, how should I put it, uh, that uh, did not show character or whatever else. It's, you know... And this is a university where power flows down. I understand that, you know, headship program and so on and so forth. And there might be reasons to change the program, but then at least discuss it and don't just say, well, sorry, and that department voted about it. And I was very shy, and still very shy in those days, so I didn't make a huge fuss about it, but I was not happy. And I had planned when I came back to go and try to raise some significant funds uh, for the science technical program, which I could, then I could have done. I think, and, and then I decided to the devil with it, and I kind of opted out, you know, the whole thing left a very bad taste. So I was looking around sort of uh, for some, something to catch my attention, and, and actually Bob Melson, whom you may know, uh, uh, the Jewish Studies program started in a very modest way. We, uh, Bob Melson and Larry Axel, who you also may still remember, they uh, were interested in doing a Holocaust faculty sort of seminar and to get a to together once a month and do something, give a paper or discuss something. And I was very happy for any kind of intellectual activity, so I said fine and, and participate, and that went very well. And so at the end of the year, uh, and Walter Hirsch was involved in it and a few others that you, I'm sure you knew, and at the end of the year uh, we said, well, you know, this, this is really neat, uh, why don't we uh, f form a Jewish studies program? We do have uh, courses and stuff, and, you know, it has to go through the procedures, the Senate, and so on and so forth, and you have to think it out, and that's what we did. And I was on all of that very peripheral. I mean, I was sympathetic, I, okay, I'll Gave participate. Some assistance. But I was not, so, okay, so that was set in motion. And in that first year, About uh, what time, when you this was, early, I'm, mid -70s? I'm trying to remember now, this was probably sometime, 19, Let's see, I came back 1977, 85, this may have been 86 okay. or somewhere along that line. Right. Um, then, um, during that first semester, as the program was on, uh, Bob Mallison came to me and said, hey Joe, you did a nice neat uh, uh, newsletter for, uh, in political science called the STPP newsletter, which sounded like a motor oil, the STPP motor oil. But, uh, and, it had, and it was free, and I had a, built a big mailing list, and I kind of enjoyed it, and I also had put 
uh, little book notes and book because I'm always. I remember keen, seeing that. And I was keen about books and free material. Lots of free material. This is before the internet and all that stuff. But I said at that point, first you have to have a little money for that, and I said to hell with it. Basically, I don't want you know. And, and there was no. I, I wanted nothing to do anymore. And there was no. There was no support there at all. No. No. So I. So when he came to me and said, "Why don't you do a newsletter for Jewish studies?" I said to Bob, "Well." Uh, that's very nice, but I'd done that. Uh, I'd like to do something a little bit more interesting, at least for me. So I um, suggested a, a, a sort of a, a larger newsletter with little little articles and little uh, a little more book. in depth. Yeah, you know, and I had sort of in the back of my mind something. You know, okay, so we had to go. You can't. Uh, the, the 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 bottom line is you can't you can't do very much. In program, in the program, you can do a lot, but you, but at some point you also need resource, which means basically ultimately money. And so uh, I said to Bob, okay, uh, we thought about a prototype and so on and so forth. And I had my daughter, you know, so we had a proto, I had a prototype. We went to D, um, to Dean uh, uh, Ringel, Bob Melz. I always went with somebody else when I went to Dean's, uh, with Bob M to Dean Ringel. And said to Dean Ringel, well, you know, we'd like to do this uh, newsletter quarterly. I always, I like, I always like to think big. No, not, a, not about once in a while, once a year. I thought not quarterly. Not occasional. Not occasional. Right. Quarterly. So uh, Bob Ringel, you know, he's a dean. He has to, uh, deans have to by, uh, by nature, and have to be careful. They can't just say yes to everything, you know. So D Dean Ringel acted like Dean. So he says, all right. He said. I'll give you two hundred dollars. He had given the program uh, very little money, seventy-five dollars. I'll give you two hundred dollars for the first two issues, and then you're on your own. So I piped up, and I said, "But Bob, can we at least try to raise our own money?" That was me. Can we at least try? He says, "Okay," and that was the key to the future. What then was the future growth of Jewish studies in Shofar? Okay, so. We'd gotten a cachet, you can raise money. So the issue then was, well, since I had piped up and said money raising, of course I became, well, fell on my <laughs> shoulders. So I, th and the natural second thing is, if you, you don't have to be a PhD or don't have to have a, 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 an MBA to understand that if you want a program and you want m uh, resources and funding and you want to have proposals, you have to have something to offer. You can't just say, hey, we like the money, Jewish study sounds great, how about giving us, no, no. So, uh, we had a Jewish studies committee, we formed a committee, so I became the fund, basically the fundraiser, and, and I like to, in my philosophy of life is, think big, but you know, within reason, you know, you can't fantasize. Don't overextend. Yeah, and think big, and then go step by step, and think big. So I tend to think big in that way, and so I thought, uh, um, well, let's do some things. You, a lot of things you can do that don't cost you anything or very little. For example, but they make an impact and they get you going. That's right. And so I had when I was that when I was the heading the 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 uh, program in science. I had also organized a weekly noon series where people from engineering and science got together and somebody spoke about something or you know which worked very very well. It didn't cost anything. You ever it gave publicity publicity to the program, and it also created the ability of people to meet together and s generate some, some activity. You know, they could, it, it, it worked, I think, very well, because I had to organize that and, and get the people and then get the rooms and all the rest of it with very little support from the department, but, but that didn't cost anything. You could do that. And the same, so I didn't invent any of the Jewish studies. I thought the same thing. We'll do it once every two weeks. So, uh, and you have lots of people, both enough people, both at Purdue, and in the community, so you could do that. And then you has also you had to report. If you have a newsletter, you have to report something. <laughs> oh, you can't. Okay, so uh, I, I so that's when I got involved in fundraising. And I had initially I had somebody uh, who was more, one of the faculty members uh, who was with me um, was such an uh, you know, to write one letter. You needed seven meetings, I believe. You, want, you know those that type? And I said, no, 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 that's the way to go. Uh, so 
Uh, and so you so the qu first question was where do you get them? Where, where you know what what kind of things can you do? You can do a, a biweekly. Uh, you can try to get some money uh, to uh, bring people in for lectures because seventy five dollars that uh, the dean gave us wasn't uh, very much to go by. And you can do a lot with a library because I'm by nature a library person. If I had to live again, I might become a librarian, probably a lot more useful than other stuff. So I like books, I like libraries, I like the idea. Uh, you know, it's also something very tangible if you do. So uh, Jews are people of the book, so you don't have to be, again, a genius to figure out if you say to people, well, you have a Jewish, you have, you have a, you know, we, we'd like to expand our whatever holdings we have into studies, you can try to get some resources. And so I did a couple of things, and you had work study people at that time, so you could use some of that. I mean, I did most of it myself, but there were work studies people there. Uh, most of the time, not worth the trouble, uh, really. You know, some of them were quite good, but then you couldn't depend on them when they were going to be there. And when exam time came, they would all of them disappear for three weeks. And so I am not by nature the most patient person, even though I can bite my tongue quite well. And believe me, as director of Jewish studies, I had to bite my tongue a lot, because when you have volunteer people you can't, you know, boss people around and say, look, if you don't do this by then, you're out. If you hire somebody, you can do that. You know, you can basically say, look, uh, you have to perform here. If you don't, you're going to have to go somewhere else. But when you depend only on your volunteers uh, and you have a lot of prima donnas, which faculty tend to be, then you, believe me, you have to bite your tongue a lot. If you, you have to, and not only with that, but also with deans, because then you have to think of the long run. If, if every time somebody something, says something asinine or kind of insulting, and I would get up and in fury, I wouldn't have lasted three months. You know what I mean? So, okay. So, uh, I had my own library. That meant that I had to find a way of finding out what the library had. So, I... I became the de facto Jew Jewish studies librarian, Judaica librarian. I got a reference work uh, about a reference, you know, stuff that Jewish libraries collection should have, and I then went through it to see what journals we had and this and that and the other. I sent around a questionnaire to the faculty saying, "Look, this is what we don't. Here are the journals we don't have. Which of them would you like? Which you think we should have, and so on and so forth." And that way, you can go out and try to get, you know, do some things. So that was a second thing, library. Uh, more or less, and sometimes other other stuff that came about. So uh, I was spending a lot of time at this. And at the same time, I was, I was also working, I was the editor of Shofar and the book editor of Shofar. I had a committee form, as you'll see in there, but, you know, a committee, a, a board of editors or whatever, this was still the Purdue at that point. Uh, you know, it, it depends. It's, it's hell, it can be helpful. I, when, when I had a group, like in Jewish studies, as I became, in effect, sort of the person deriving it in a way. In fact, there were two people, Bob Melson and, and Larry Axel, who were the first kind of chairs of the program, uh, were very nervous. That, you know, they kept saying, and, and when I, you know, since I was sort of heading this thing in a way, I would say I, I'm a very strong believer in running things democratically. You know, and not just being not, but that means that people, if, if you involve people, they have to be involved in a meaningful way. That they, they cannot be and should not be jerked around. If you vote, if you have people coming, so we had, uh, I wanted immediately meetings twice. We arranged that. It wasn't only me, of course, but I was very strong on having, uh, uh, the, having faculty meeting, the Jewish Studies Committee was the committee, anybody in the faculty who came and was interested would participate and then there was an agenda and we would discuss and we would vote and the way the vote went, this was throughout the 18 years, the way the vote, that's the way it went. I might say, oh no, I don't like this decision, but you can't do that. You can't say, I don't like this decision, I'm gonna do it my way because first of all, it's, it's not uh, fair and not right and second of all, you can't keep people. You have to involve them in meaningful ways and that's sort of the way things went. Uh, now, um, I uh, found, th th so you had to get money. The foundation is resources. You can do a lot, as I've said before, or a fair amount, without resources. You know, there are three elements of building a program. One is having good ideas, or ideas that are workable, and having a kind of a vision that makes sense for, the, for this institution. Purdue is not a Sorbonne, it's not Harvard, it's a place that has a kind of, 
Okay, so you have to do things that, but think big. I mean, think can happen, things have happened at Purdue, uh, which people never thought was one of the best English uh, journals is at the English department. I mean, who would have thought uh, one of the, you know, uh, something in fiction, you know the book. One the Seymour Review? The no, the other, there's another one, much longer. Oh. Uh, fiction, modern fiction or something. Oh, a fiction. very, very good journal. So things can happen at Purdue just because it's in the Midwest and people think it's a ten, or used to think and still maybe think it's a technological university. Doesn't mean you cannot do great, important things here. You just have to have the vision and you have to have the, uh, you know, the, the energy and you have to have, you know, you have to have ideas, you have to have uh, people. Commitment, you know, commitment, uh, good ideas. You have to have the commitment and the energy, the level of people, and you need resources. Of all, of all those things are the most. The ideas are not the most important thing. Is getting the people, because if you do it all yourself, you burn out, you know, or whatever else. Or it's not good for the program because when you leave, the whole thing may fold. So anyway, so I was always conscious of all of these three things. What can you do? And I'm interested in concrete, I, I'm interested in impact. I don't, I, I, I'm interested, or was interested in uh, not glossy public relations things. I wasn't interested in letting people know how wonderful I was, you know, I'm the director, blah, 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 blah. I was more interested in giving, having people get credit, you know, and, and I can be in the background, it's all right, I'm, I want to see what we can really achieve and do. You're and the energizer, getting with the Yeah, you yeah. know, so, and you have to find reward, since you can't reward people very concretely, but if you have a department, you can try to get people who do the real good work, you know, promoted and, and, and rewarded. Uh, the only rewards we had here was okay, we did get quite a bit of money actually, in a way, for a program like ours, and you could also give people psychological rewards. You can, you can, you can make them know that you appreciate what they do. It doesn't cost you anything to, you know, to do that, but it means a lot. And you can also create a sense of community. I was interested in the sense of community. So we got together socially, some occasionally, you know, and to make people feel they're in together on this and that they're involved and, and so on and so forth. And that their ideas are, uh, you know, it wasn't just me. I didn't want it to be just me. So when ideas came up, we would talk about it. And then, you know, we, we, uh, and, and I, I had to delegate them so that you'd have a committee uh, on uh, lectures and whatnot. Well, the committee on lectures, you, 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 you guys, you, you do it. And if they came along and they did something, I would think, well, you know, I was always sometimes concerned about making it too narrow, you know. I mean, uh, you're having too, too many lectures on the Holocaust, for example, or, or too many lectures on ancient Israel. And I, I, uh, my view was we ought the, the, the lecture ought to also bring new kind of perspectives, uh, new sort of things, you know. Uh, but there's a propensity to. So, but I couldn't very well. If you have response, I tell you, you delegated. You have the responsibility. You do it this way. All I can say is, look, uh, guys, can we? Uh, I know this is important, and you, you know, but could we try to get somebody to talk about dance or, or the theater or something else? You know, just to open it up. Well, I could say it sort of gently, but I couldn't start trying to pressure people. Otherwise, I'd say, to hell with you. Go and do it yourself. So okay. So and, and uh, it's a delicate balance. It is really. It really and as I said, you had to sometimes really bite your tongue with a dean too. I remember once a dean, uh, this was Dean Wingle, he called me up on the phone and he started chewing me out. I mean, really chewing me out. Oh, he went on for 15 minutes and I just didn't say anything. Uh, he chewed me out. Oh, about the budget something. And I said at the end of 15, but, but, but Bob, I had nothing whatsoever to do with this. <laughs> you know, he started bawling me out. And, and I could have taken offense and said, oh my God, how dare, me, I'm a, you know, I'm, you know, who, who, who the hell is this guy to bore me out? But I said, look, uh, so I, I know, uh, you know I, have a I had to build up a thick skin. Anyway, uh, so, the, the, so to get money, which is sort of a key thing, uh, the, the first thing, money was, well, I had to find out uh, I, I was not a fundraiser by inclination or by uh, experience. I uh, so, but a little common sense can go a long way. So, first things to figure out: well, there's a concentric circles. First of all, you try to get some resources and stuff from the people in the community. Okay, so all right, send out a letter to uh, the synagogues and what have you, and 
and then you let people. And then the second one is I found out there were uh, had been fraternities uh, and sororities, uh, Jewish fraternities, but they had stopped. They were no longer here. But I, f I got a hold of a mailing list of uh, of those. So naturally, I began to develop that mailing list. And then I found out that, and, and then so this went on for about two years. In the meantime, since I'm sort of compulsive. <laughs> I started Show Farm with 20, the first issue was 20 pages. By the end of the first year, I, I don't know exactly, but it was substantially, it was now about 50 or 60 pages. By the end of the second year, it was about 70 or 80. But, you know, so it, was, it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And initially, it depended mostly about contributions from people at Purdue, the first couple of issues. But then, in the meantime, the book of you expanded, because the book of you, my, my launch with the book of you, was and still is because I'm still involved with the book. I still am the book editor. Why am I still the book editor? Because I like to get books into the Buddha Library. Okay, and how do you do that? Well, uh, you, over time you build up a you know I have a huge database of publishers and and, and whatnot. Well, you uh, you get book you know you get some books. You have to find out what the books are. You have to in those days it was all done by typing and it was a you know, pain in the neck, but. But you got it done. You got a, and then you, you, the books come in, and if you get 100 books, uh, you, you decide you can only review 20 of them. So, or try to get 20 reviews for the, this is when it's sort of small, or whatever. And then the other books you can put into the library. But you have to do something uh, with it, and that's when I made a separation between book reviews and book notes. Book notes are the, as, as you will see if you look at Shofar, are, sm are not teeny weeny ones. They're big enough to tell you really what the book is about, but they're not evaluations. They're simply a report. This is what the book is about. Mostly taken from the uh, publisher's uh, publicity stuff t with a hype taken out. Okay, so because. Then, then uh, publishers want to see something. They're not going to send you books just because. That sounds like what Brian Lamb used to do. That book notes on C-SPAN. Yeah, very similar. Yeah. So, you know, in the meantime, I found out about the joke. The, the, so we did get raised, money was being raised. At the end of two or three years, uh, there was the real distinct. It, it didn't work very extremely well because, to the first year or so, year and a half, the uh, the um, chauffeur had to be done through political science and the, and the head was very unsympathetic so everything was always at the bottom the last and I don't like you know uh, didn't like that it ought to be in a timely fashion uh, so it was a last on everything and I had to constantly push to try to get it so uh, there was um, uh, somebody uh, doctor what's his name now he was at the, he was a hospital he was at the hospital a doctor he said well you got uh, and I also brought in one or two people from the outside of the community. Said uh, you're this is you know thinking of Dr. Clatch. Yes, he's one. Uh, he was um, very helpful, and he said this isn't going to work. You're you're going to have to go and get some money. And he suggested the Jewish Federation. So I went down to the Jewish Federation, and uh, I believe I took some people down with me. I always not always, but. Typically, I went down there to talk to them, and they gave us, you know, they gave us money in order to uh, to hire a half-time secretary, Marilyn Fleeter. You may know Marilyn Fleeter. Right? I recognize the name. Yeah. So we got Marilyn Fleeter. That took some of the pressure off, and then eventually, so we went down there also to get. They gave us some money through their philanthropic as part. That and eventually it, it came up to about $37,000 a year, which was vast, no small change. And, but I had to go down there, we had to go down there every year to make our presentation. And every year we had to explain to them why there should be a Jewish studies program at Purdue, because they couldn't figure it out. Uh, there was one at IU, much bigger and much better developed, and much, much more resources. And we would have to say to them, well, you know, these. The, you know, and we'd have to, my rationale was also, make your weaknesses your strong point. They would say, well, how many Jewish students? First of all, I would have to tell people here in the community that Jewish studies was not a Jewish consciousness raising enterprise. If you want that, go to Hillel. You know, I mean, it's a university. Uh, that, uh, somebody can come from Mars 
As far as I'm concerned, if they're interested and are capable, they should, you know, somebody from Mars can lead the Jewish Studies program. As far as I'm concerned, if they're capable, I don't care whether they're Jewish or, or Buddhist or whatever, you know. So, so I have to explain to them, it's not a consciousness raising, and that some people here weren't very happy about that. And then I had to explain to the, we had to explain to the people in Indianapolis over and over again, because the ball changed, that precisely because there's so few Jewish students here. This is why we need Jewish studies. You know. um, so, so they gave us, you know, they gave us, they did, we did quite well with, with them. Uh, and I always tried to also, and I give annual reports to, I kept everybody informed about, ev- you know, in the program, about everything, the budget, full information about everything so they can make Decision and 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 what is called transparency. It's not, it's not a profound uh, new idea, and uh, we uh, so that worked. I think. Uh, is the Jewish Federation is that just a state thing or is that is that a national? It's in Indianapolis. Oh, okay. It's the Jewish. Uh, Do they have them in different states or is this? Every state? major city tends to have a Jewish okay. federation. Okay. But it's a foundation, huge. It's a, the foundation must be. An, well, a the foundation is is, is part of it. People, right. uh, people give uh, when they leave their wills. They may give a. a right. For example, in the f- uh, once once for about I don't know ten years or so, there was a part of the f- of the foundation that had uh, I forget the name. It's in there, I think, but uh, a name of a fund. And from that fund, we got for about ten years five thousand dollars a year. So there's, there's, just for there's books. special things within. Yeah, just for books. It was just for books. Sure. Well, that enabled us to order all kinds of things. Again, f- f- uh, focusing on the on the faculty. What is it that we really need? Uh, how can we best spend this? And my view also was try to build on that money. In other words, what I would do is I would go to the library and I'd say, look, we've got some money here. Uh, why don't we match it? We'll put $5,000 in. You put $5,000 in. The history puts it. You know, and that way you, you build. You know, that's sort of the basic. And same is true with lectures. I try to make all of this, not just Jewish studies, take good care of this money, make it, make it, use it. You know, but use it well. And so, so we got a lot of stuff that way, um, and you have to you you have to be persuasive. You also have to kind of think imaginatively. You know, and I know it's what about the uh, teaching of that? Did, were you involved in getting faculty to be teaching? The well, courses? we had uh, that was one of the things we didn't work. You know, we had enough faculty, but none of the faculty were lines. It was all, well, Bob Melson was teaching uh, Holocaust and a course on Israel, and uh, uh, somebody else was teaching ancient Israel, Gordon Young, and somebody was teaching on this. It, and I try, you know, uh, there wasn't much, whatever the reason is, I said, uh, subsequently, no, you said I tried, but sub- then subsequently, when uh, uh, the dean uh, Parcel came, uh, and I was still in, okay, involved, I kept emphasizing what we need is lines, lines. The most important thing with Jewish studies is lines, 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 lines. Line. But lines are very hard to get, and you ha- it's a question of getting money from. Also, we had a very sk- sketchy development during my tenure that was not. You know, the emphasis on, on funding with a huge development team wasn't yet around. It was sort of a buy and buy thing. My, in my case, I had a real problem because the dean, uh, uh, at one point, just to give you an example of the kind of idiocy you run across, not as idiocy, but is uh, the dean, the head, who became the head, you know who it is, who became the, the, the dean of the School of Liberal Arts. He was the head of political science, became the dean of the of the School of Liberal Arts and then moved on to Greener Pastures in New York. Um, I had had a proposal, I'd written a proposal, a big mm. proposal, a two proposals, a, a pilot a, a, a project for this proposal. The whole idea was to uh, invite a distinguished professor in, in Jewish study, in different aspects of Jewish studies over the years, bring them here, do it right, 
you know, and have them spend a whole year here, have them give a series of public lectures that would be publishable, have them interact with the faculty, uh, have a, uh, a review group so then we're not getting ripped off, you know, you have to be careful here, so you uh, provide the incentives so they really do write the book and stuff like this. And the whole thing, at the, this was back in the maybe early 90s, no, in the, in the, uh, somewhere in the 80s there. Uh, and then uh, I wrote a proposal, I s and the pilot proposal, let's try this for five years and see how it works. We're going to the dean with Bob Melson, because like I said I always took somebody along for, for counter, you know, for counter verification, so n somebody couldn't say, oh, I never said that. You know what I mean? Um, so I had submitted this proposal. The proposal was probably altogether. If you do it right, you want to pay a good salary. You want to have um, the person attract somebody. Yeah, yeah. You want a person to have a teaching assistant. You want to do this and the other. I think the proposal uh, called for about a million and a half. This was a lot of money in those days. Well, I submitted it as you had to. Okay, that's fine. And I waited a year for you know. They had to go over the dean's desk. I think I, I waited nine months to a year until I finally were called in. And the dean said, well, this is all right. Uh, you know, he made a few, but I want you to fully understand, he said, this coming that this proposal is very low on my set of priorities. I didn't ask him, should it be higher on the priority? I simply had to get an approval. Okay, so this isn't important to me. A million and a half dollars, uh, if we were to get it, isn't important to you. So I said to him, I can't call him by his first name, I said to him, you mean to tell me, uh, let me understand this. You mean to tell me that, that if, uh, if you get this money, you won't accept it? No, 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 no. At that point, I, I said, forget about this, you know. And I was, there was such a, I think the problem was, at that time, if I, if I would have got, he was probably afraid we would get the money. In which case, this would be the largest proposal in the history of the School of Liberal Arts, and that wouldn't, what, you know, I don't know what the reason was, but clearly, if you were, if you were at all interested You'd say, Bob and Joe, marvelous, just try. I'm behind you 110%. So you get the drift. So that sort of thing. So, okay, so uh, the, money came, the money was fine. Uh, the, prog grew, the, program the program grew significantly. Right. Um, we tried to, a uh, lot of lectures and stuff and other stuff. And uh, we also, at the same time, Again, it's a, we had tried when we started the program. Bob, uh, Gordon Young and myself were probably the most active. You know, Bob Melson and Larry Axel, they were chairs for a while, but they were, really, from my perspective, they had other things they were, you know, sort of, and I got more and more, of course, involved in this, including a full-time job with political science and a family that wouldn't let me become a complete workaholic. So uh, at some point, uh, Gordon Young and I said, well, you know, we'd like to get some help from the American Association, Jew there's American Association of Jewish Studies, which is a national organization, which meets once a year. So we wrote to them, and uh, as I recall, we wrote a letter, and they didn't even answer the letter, they simply sent us a form saying, yeah, yeah, if you want to join the association, join the association. We wanted just some advice, we didn't want any money. Total disinterest. And uh, an enormously, con this is, an, they met at Harvard all the time, an enormously condescending attitude. I went down there for a uh, uh, conference once or twice, and I found it utterly off putting. I don't like that word, but I'll use it. And, and condescending. You know, oh, 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 I can't be bothered with you, you're from Purdue. Uh, I didn't like that. I mean, that gets my gander up. So Gordon and I talked about that. You know, we ought to form, uh, there are lots of, I sympathize with the, this is temperament, I sympathize with the small, with the small fry, you know, with the, with the people who are not big shots and big programs, uh, who very often can be very, very good. In any case, they deserve to be recognized and to be helped. So I said, why don't we form a consortium of, small, of smaller, you know, there are all these f uh, uh, faculty teaching Jewish studies courses all over the Midwest, and uh, wouldn't they like to get together and be felt that, you know, uh, you, know you get the idea? So we were thinking of a consortium. That's, that was the idea. Uh, and then we, there was an organizing conference here. Uh, we organized at Purdue in association with some other conference. So we had about seven or eight people from different 
places at, uh, in the Midwest, uh, Spurtus and IU didn't send anybody up, I don't think, uh, Hebrew Union College uh, from Tennessee and other places. And we decided that uh, there wasn't going to be, a, a consortium was too complicated, so we formed a Midwest Jewish Studies Association. We were instrumental, and in the early first 10 years, really very extremely active in the Midwest Jewish, because, and I thought again, make it, uh, give us consortium-like features. Nowadays you don't need a lot of this stuff because you can do it through the internet. But nonetheless, and it's it's now in its 20th year or 22nd year, I don't know, or maybe more, I think more, 25th year. And uh, it's basically a venue for people to come in every year. And, uh, to, and, and, and I was very, uh, and Gordon and I were very insistent and, and tried to do this to make people feel welcome. You know, none of this clubbiness, oh, I know you and you know, when you see people who are new and want to make them feel welcome, that, that sort of, just treat them the way you'd like to be treated, you know, so. So that, so we, we formed the Midwest Jewish Studies Association. That was another, so we could say this, you know, we could say we've done something, it's visible, it's, it, it didn't turn out quite the way I'd hoped, but hey, it's. It's still going. And also, uh, that was a, uh, a part of Shofar, because Shofar then became the official journal of the Midwest Jewish Studies Association. And Shof and the Midwest Jewish Studies Association became the model for the Western Jewish Studies Association, because I got a call from uh, the guy uh, at San Diego State uh, University who said, can you tell, you know, I basically became sort of a, a quasi-consultant. How did you do it, what do you do, blah, 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 blah. And so they formed, and then eventually it became also the, the journal for that association. So that got us a few extra subscriptions because I was always concerned about how many subscriptions. Now in the initially, <laughs> the subscriptions would all go to uh, everybody who gave any contribution. Uh, and that got us over the 200 number, which was the one for the post office we, in particular. Uh, but then the university decided, no, this won't, then eventually this, this won't do. Uh, there's some tax problems, although I couldn't quite see why. Uh, so our, our subscription list went down significantly. And, we, and, and that's the other story. So the journal, I, then, the journal then eventually, by, by the seventh year when, when Nancy Lean came, on. She became the we got some more money from the federation. To, uh, eventually, it was going to be for the. It didn't quite specify what for, but I did, I basically decided with my colleagues that we weren't going to get. We, we didn't want a full time uh, secretary because we didn't need a full time secretary, even though it wouldn't give us any more work, and that we needed a, a managing editor, which Nancy uh, was. Nancy was very 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 good and is very, very good, very capable person. And I realized, you know, as I worked with her, as you know, she was managing, she was a program editor. And so she also, in the meantime, I had actually, after the first year, uh, put out a quarterly newsletter for a program newsletter. So each four times a year, I put that together in a, in a day or two, you know, with a, a little fun piece and this and that and the other, uh, with an, uh, a newsletter of about 12 pages. Okay, so, that didn't take that much work. You know, you, you just had the, some boilerplate, no, some stuff here and useful stuff, and then you send it out, and that was all before the internet. Um, so all of that was, uh, you know, again, you want to make your resources work as well as you can. That, that was the way I least I saw it. And you have to, uh, uh, so by uh, the seventh, year, this was really a professional journal. And then the Bob Nelson came to me, oh, this is all in, the, in that, uh, in more detail. And, uh, he came to me one day and, and said, you know, we ought to, um, how about having a peer review? Because uh, young faculty would benefit by that. And I said, great, oh, I love peer review because it took all the responsibility or some more, a lot of it off my shoulder because you had a, uh, um, uh, and, and not only peer, peer, the peer review of the articles, because it meant people would come to me and pressure me sometimes. Oh, I have a great grad, graduate student, so I don't do, you know. And, and it gets very tricky to say, well, that's very nice, and but. And I'm not an expert, really, in many. You know, I can get a sense of whether it's well written. And I also attended. We, I also formed a, uh, we formed a, uh, a board of, uh, uh, not editors, what do you call it? 
whatever it is, the board. Advisory. Advisory board. And then we would meet um, once a year and make decisions. For example, uh, some people, I was, so, I, I had, I thought, I, for example, thought we should change the name from Shofar to something like a boring, like the Jewish interdisciplinary. And they all said, no, 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 uh, uh, because it's a no name. It, what is, fine, okay. You know. And then I, they wanted, some people wanted, uh, uh, thinking about putting some poetry in or something like this, which I like, kind of like, but they said no. Uh, and when this, you know, when you have a board and you vote on these things, you have to follow through. Fine. So, so, so it, uh, things were working. I uh, things worked. I think reason, you know, reasonably well. I think the big problem was lines, and that has, I think, the current. Uh, uh, in, in the last couple of years, things have improved somewhat. Um, in, in that, um, that has some money has come because we had it now put for staff, and I don't know exactly what's going on, but uh, we got one line. We got one line. We have a director. For, no, I was a director, of course. Uh, no, what happened? What happened is that after about five, well, I don't know how many years exactly, four, five, six years of doing all of this on a voluntary basis, just to show you what, what you're dealing with here. I mean, I, I can say this now. I didn't put it in the article, but, but uh, uh, or maybe I did. I don't think so. I didn't really want to embarrass somebody too much. Uh, there was one of those financial uh, Strictures, you know, think, things are tight in the state government, and we are going to have cut back. So the, then, the same dean that we're talking about, uh, I had, uh, I had gone. I, after about five years or so of doing this all on a voluntary basis, I had decided enough is enough. Uh, it was taking up maybe 30, 40 hours extra a week, and uh, you know. Uh, Editing in a journal, uh, book reviews, uh, the book uh, the book part, um, uh, administering the program, uh, and all the other stuff was taking a fair amount of time. And I decided, well, I really ought to get at least a course or something off, or something. So I said something has to be done, and I was uh, I'm a serious, but I said. Either, either I get some relief here one way or the other, or I'm out of here. And I wasn't joking, because I'm not into empty gestures. So uh, at that point, there was a, a, an acting, uh, the dean I'm talking about from the Department of the Dean, uh, the Trackman was the acting dean. He's a very nice, very nice guy. And he, uh, and I didn't want to bargain here. They said, well, we'll give you one course off. I said, well, no, no, uh, the summer, you know, they'll give me summer pay. I said, I wanted two. So I got two summer, I got, this, I got a, a summer salary for this, or oh, equivalent. Okay, so that had, Dean Trackman had decided that. And a year or two later when this came up, uh, I got a little letter from the then this dean saying, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to take away your, your, your salary, and uh, you're welcome to go to, uh, uh, to the current chair of the Department of Political Science and see whether you can get a summer teaching job. And he thought that I would, you know, since I love the Jewish Studies program so much, I would just bite my tongue and say, oh, well, life is tough and, you know, moan and bitch or whatever else. And I said, I called my colleagues together, some senior professors and said, here's a, I didn't respond to him at all. I said, here's a letter. If this stays, I'm out of here. And uh, maybe you want to talk to the dean. So, and I, I, was, I wasn't joking. So, um, this dean uh, called me in. Again, it was somewhere, it was, I think I was Bob Nelson or maybe Gordon Young. And said, I made a mistake. Yeah, damn right, you made a mistake. He thought he could. Now, again, the immorality of it, that's what struck me. Uh, so uh, then they made it formal. Uh, you know, they, they kind of wrote it, a director, 
Ms. Nadell. So that uh, I was clear on this. Um, in the meantime, of course, I was also bringing in very large numbers of books because not only was I bringing in books through Shofar, I had also become the book editor of a journal called Science, Technology, and Society, which is a bi-monthly journal. Is MIT published that? Uh, I think it's Sage now. Oh, okay. And but MIT, uh, I think, was at one time. It, mm, no, uh, a similar maybe, one that they yeah. used to do. Right. Uh, it, uh, and this didn't require anything except for me to bring books in, an abstract thing okay. for short things. So it was very, it was a very, and then send it to them so they could put it up. So I brought in a huge amount of books because as long as you send stuff out and got to the publisher. And, um, and I, in the meantime, I had asked the library to keep a record of all the stuff that we brought in and how much it was worth and so on and so forth. So, that the, so that I thought at the end of the year I could have a report. You know, the printout was this, was this thick. And uh, sometimes uh, the value, because I got a lot more books for the science, technology, society stuff, because they come, books come in very easy. You can get 100 books. Um, you know, it's it, it, and I think the total value of these books sometimes came as high as one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. So I was, you know, because my thing is, is, I want something visible. I want some impact. I also thought that maybe then I would send the report to uh, the dean and I would send it to the library, let them know we're doing Jewish studies is doing something. Well, it didn't make any difference really. I don't think uh, a, a clever, a, a good dean, a clever dean like Peggy Rowe, would send me a letter saying, I'm wonderful, you know, great, uh, you know, work, keep up the good work, fine. Uh, because I understood that Jewish studies was not the center of the universe of the dean over there. It's a small little thing in their universe, okay? So, uh, but there is a way of dealing with this nicely. And, and I'm not doing it for the reward or whatever else. I'm doing it, I do the best I can, you know, and, and I'm trying still. Today. And you so got a book play too. All the books well, that, book was, that, that happened. That happened at the end of uh, when I retired finally. From the university? From yeah, the when I retired from, my, you know, from the university, yeah, 1994, I think it was. Okay. The library, that was not a happy event in my department either, but I, I always. Th my philosophy was to take the high road if you possibly can. You know, don't try to get even. Don't try to bear grudges. I do, you don't have to be happy about it, but you know what I mean. So I, with the department, I kept. You know, I won't go into that story. Uh, so the library uh, decided to give a luncheon in honor, you know, and whatever else, and with, the, with a plate and with a bookmark. And well, what was the bookmark for? You know, I mean. Uh, your books. No, no, these were going to be for the books that for the future. They weren't going to take all the, they wouldn't know anymore which books were Jewish right. studies books. Right. You know, they. Unless they walk through and check it off on the Yeah, they never know. I knew that they were hoping I would continue because, okay, and I, as I said, I like it. I like, I like the idea. I enjoy, I enjoy the, the process. I get a kick out of it and uh, whatever, in a modest way, maybe that's my largest and all the rest of it will s sort of sink away. But, you know, That's very nice. You know, I and mean... That book, and that, that bookmark is nice. Yeah. You know, is. So I'm very... You know, I, uh, I did have a lot of trouble, an enormous amount of trouble, you probably know, with uh, uh, the, 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 head, the director or the, the head of the Hissy Library who eventually left, you know, who he is, the Hungarian. Remember? He was... The problems I had, we had with him, were he's a good librarian. As a librarian, I thought he was very good. But as an administrator, he was the pits. Uh, he treated his people terribly, I thought. You know, very European, apparatchnik type. Uh, personally, he's very pleasant. But he, since we, the Jewish Studies program, not just me, said to him, in the, no, we got some money. And he said, give me the money and, and stay out of it. And we said, not me, but he said, we can't do that. We are perfectly willing to work with you, but we can't just give you a total carte blanche. And he then became extremely punitive. I couldn't, he, he, he sent all the books, that we, new books, into the, uh, you know, into the stacks, not in the stacks, into the, 
into the undergraduate library where they would be hidden, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, we couldn't order anything. We had the money for journals, and oh, he made, so I had to work around him. So, okay, you don't want to do this. I was prepared to send all the books to him so he could distribute them and get some, you know, but, but so I worked, I found a way of working around it by contributing the books directly to gifts and exchange, and, and then they could, yeah. so, you know, but you have to, that's the other frustrations you have to live with, and you do the best you can, and and it worked out in the long run. You know, there are all kinds of stories here. Because he eventually left, and then you know, you know the story you know, a little bit, perhaps. He left. It's he not left critical, it, right. but I mean, the point is, it was. It isn't always easy to work with people. That's true, right? Yeah. What about uh, your exp any retirement activities? Are you anything special? You're still with the. You said you're the book reviewer. Or well, um, I just when I decided to finally step down there were a couple of reasons for it but one of them is I would always thought that a time comes the continuity is also what I was interested in and certainly for the for the for the, for the, for the program but there I've got a little to say about but for the chauffeur I thought it was important to step down at some point because I know from you know sort of some not experience but I sort of know about it, something that's very difficult for people to let go. They, it's my baby, I'm going to stick with it forever and a day, and they won't let go, and then when they leave, <laughs> or whatever, it's not good. So I just, I was perfectly willing to step down, uh, and so I said, I'm stepping down, I gave my recommendation, I had, there were enough papers in the pipeline, and enough book reviews for a year or two, and I wanted to see what would happen if, if it, if it if it didn't work out, that's life. Um, and uh, so that's when Zev Garber, and then the university, or the dean, also insisted that somebody from Purdue also be a co-editor. That worked out fine, and that's worked out pretty well. Um, uh, you know, there's, uh, people take the journal in different directions. Uh, that's fine. I think, that, and the journal today is, and I think I have that maybe in there, uh, about three or four years, maybe five years ago, I was at an, an annual meeting of the Midwest Jewish Studies Association, and somebody said to me, I didn't know who that person was, that you know, Shofar has become the preeminent journal in Jewish studies. I said, I should have said, what makes you think that? You know, I felt back in amazement. I said, you know, nice to hear, but I didn't. So I said, I said to myself, come on, come on. No, because our subscription, had been about 150. So we were this, this many, many, no, from time to time I would say, why am I bothering her? They're only about 150, or maybe at most, uh, perhaps 200. And, and then, you know, half of them were the library, but no one ever looks at them, or very few people. And the other, you're like, eh, is it worth all this trouble? So I then decided, because that what happened was that the University of Nebraska Press had uh, had wanted the journal and they were taking care of the printing and whatnot. They did a good job of it, but they they, they didn't follow the contract. They were supposed to give us an, a business report and, and they weren't working. And they, I tried to get to work with them to, to try to increase the subscriptions and so on and so forth. Very unresponsive. And when it came to, we had a three-year contract, we expanded it, and then came six years, and if you didn't do something, it would fall, uh, fall over for another six years. And when the question came of renegotiating the contract, at that time Project Muse had come on, and that generated money. And they, so my view was there ought to be some equity here. We do most of the work. We ought to get some of the, the, the money. It wasn't a question of how necessarily or how much. They said, at that point, they said categorically, and we only had about a month left. Take it or leave it. Uh, not a, we're not we're not negotiating. We want it all. And that you know, and I talked with, with Gordon Young, and we went to to uh, what's his name, Tom uh, Tom Bacher. Bacher, and I had already talked to him earlier, and he was willing, to, quite eager, willing to take it over, and so we had a fallback immediately, and that turned out to be very. Uh, he was quite. It's been a very good relationship. 
and a lot of things have happened. So another part of Jewish studies is that Shof, not only is, is Shofar doing extremely well, other journals are there now, Jewish studies journal, and quite an increasing number of books. And the money that's for us, I mean, not be much, is now we just renegotiated the contract. You know, Tom Bacher was a little bit uh, reluctant. You know, I think we were getting about 18 percent. You know, and you don't. And I said to the director, uh, Dan Frank, you know, one doesn't want to push too. You don't want to push too hard. But nonetheless, we we're really doing. Well. It's all photo ready. It's all there for them to send through. We're doing most of the work. We have expenses. We have, you know, the salary plus the increased benefits plus postage and all the rest of it. Uh, it seemed to me then I, I did talk to Tom about it, and he was willing to increase it, but he was very, you know, slow about doing it. So now we have renegotiated, the, and we have a 50-50, which seems to me eminently reasonable. And that the money that's coming in there, you'd be surprised. So. When, when I found out about Project Muse and also on, on, on EBSCO, the EBSCO database has it, I called up the people in their business offices and said, can you give me a figure about how many, uh, how many people use um, on Project Muse? How many people actually download or look at the articles and stuff? Well, it's been increasing. This last year, I believe it was over uh, close to 100,000, 100,000. And the money that's coming in is increasing every year. So, uh, you know, and, I, and then I, I, they sent me a list of all of the, all of the universities that, uh, for example, Project News has about three, th no, uh, EBSCO has about 3,200 subscribers. They're out there, if they have a library on the moon, there'll be an EBSCO on the moon. I mean, they, they have places I never heard of. I was absolutely flabbergasted. So when you look at this uh, and you see and they had a printout also of who, which, you know, you can do this. Uh, the, the, the combined total here is, is, uh, is probably now about 120,000 a year. Now, when you compare that to what the library used to be like, where if you were lucky, if three people would look at this amongst all of you know, who goes to the library to check up on Shofa? Well, maybe one or two do. And some people get it because they're, they're members of the association. But, so the impact, and then you, you uh, this generates more interest and so on and so forth. So I think it's probably not too, since this is an interdisciplinary journal, it has special issues. You'll see at the back here all the special issues that were done until 19. I decided to put this in. All the special issues on different themes. Um, so uh, when somebody prints down on the Israeli film, they're likely to get Project Muse or something else right there at the top. Okay, so this now is really, uh, th this is what I mean by the impact of the, of the of the internet and of websites and and same is true of being the book editor. I mean, the the headaches and the, the you have to have the patience of Job uh, and to wait for these things to return a month or two. I mean, it's a miracle I got this thing out at all. Now you just send out the email, a form letter, uh, but the book, and and then you uh, you ask people if they can't do the book review in the form letter. Uh, please let me. If you, if you can't do it yourself, could you please let me know somebody who might be able to do it? And if I really try, eight out of ten times, I'll get somebody. Yeah. And sometimes, very, and you don't have to wait three months. You can, you can decide to wait three days or three weeks. I usually wait. Uh, sometimes I don't wait uh, very much. I wait two or three days. I figure if you, don't, if you can't be bothered to go to your computer in three days, then maybe I should look somewhere else. But uh, how, and it all depends. So the the impact of the of the um, of the uh, of this whole uh, confluence of technology has been immense. Now it's not all for the good. That's what I sort of point out. Right. Uh, a lot of sloppiness and and maybe um, people. There was something to be said for having uh, things slower, so people had to think more and crank out things and, and what have you and also the ultimate the ultimate uh, quality of what emerges from whatever the, sh the book or the, or the, or the journal uh, isn't doesn't depend on the technology itself it's what you do I mean uh, you know you, you can make it faster it can make it neater make it nicer make it more glossy you can do all kinds of wonderful things and it can also of course Enhance the wonderful thing I think is that by and large now it makes it possible for 
for uh, scholars and, and libraries uh, in small places all over the globe to have access and, right, yeah. and do things they couldn't do before, which I think is terrific. Right. But there are some real possible negative effects here. Well, it's, it's a balance, you know. Yeah. In closing, any special co any comments that you'd like to, in summary, to look back? Done a lot, and you kept busy. Yeah, I, I, it has to be a somewhat of a, of a challenge, like the challenge with book reviewing is to, is to, right. is to, hunt, is to find the reviewers and try to get good reviewers, and, right. and that's kind of, it keeps me out of, it keeps me out of trouble and keeps me interested. And then, of course, I also get to read some of the books that come in. I read first, and then the, they come out, and, and uh, so long as, you know, I can continue that, I will continue that. Also, I like the... Uh, the uh, uh, the atmosphere of the library much more than I when I first came here. As I said, it was a, it was um, a different ball game. And they've upgraded the facility too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think the current librarian is very very good. Mm -hmm. um, now, you know, there's some emerging problems here for libraries that, uh, and also the uh, impact of Google there. Is Google going to control the whole universe or, or <laughs> what? You know, it's, it, there are some real problems here. Dr. Uh, Haber, I want to thank you very much for listening. It was very nice. Thank you. So this will have a lot more stuff. Yes, that's good.